research at Fundstrat. Also joining us is Professor Raghurajan, former IMF chief economist and governor of the Reserve Bank of India, a professor of finance with the University of Chicago Booth a school of business. Gentlemen, it's great to have you both on Power Lunch. And Professor Rajan, I want to start with you. Uh, incredible just to see how quickly the market narrative has changed from expecting a rate cut in June now to some economists saying perhaps not at all this year. Uh, you've been in the seat that Powell is in, different country, India. But still, I'm curious how you think he navigates this complicated scenario that we're in, which is hotter economy with inflation remaining much higher than expected. And at the same time, rates also staying higher, the impact that could have on consumers. Yes. Uh, I mean, clearly what's happened is we've had three strong readings of inflation. One you can dismiss, uh, certainly the January one, but uh, the, uh, the next two basically suggest inflation is not coming down. In fact, it's going up. And if you look at the measure that the Fed has looked at most closely, which is the super core measure of inflation, taking out housing, it's gone up at an 8.2% rate over the last three months. So this is this is something to worry about. Uh, is inflation coming down steadily, as it seemed at the end of last year, or is it uh, having a new set of legs and moving up? So, so my sense is, you know, they're going to do what they did, which is watch and wait. But, uh, you know, you heard uh, 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 you know, the New York Fed uh, president talking for the first time about potentially uh, rate hikes. I, I think that's still some ways away, uh, uh, serious talk about that. But uh, clearly, the kind of rate cuts that were expected are off the table. Uh, certainly in the next meeting, uh, they have no more news uh, on inflation or the labor markets. And it's likely they will continue pausing. But how long they will pause is now uh, very much in question. Tom, Professor Rajan mentioned John Williams, a New York Fed president, who did just mentioned rate hikes, but he just said that's not his base case. But even the fact that he mentioned it, you saw the two-year move to around 4.99%, which is a high for this year. Uh, you still have this uh, notion that stocks can continue to outperform if rates stay high. How long do you think that theory will last? Well, I think it's going to be valid as long as one of several things happens. One is that uh, as long as the economy remains resilient and robust, and so far earnings have actually been coming in quite good. I mean, we're only sort of at the start of earnings season, but already Q1 looks good. And I think the second is that inflation, uh, I, I think inflation really has a bifurcation taking place because even as the professor said, it's super core. The reason Supercore is annualizing at 8% is auto insurance. If you took Supercore out of, sorry, if you took auto insurance out of Supercore, uh, the long-term average is around 2.7, and it's actually annualizing at around 2.7% right now. So the biggest driver of inflation are the two stubborn components of auto insurance and shelter. So I don't know if Williams really wants to be raising interest rates or hiking just because auto insurance rates are high. Um, and I think the third thing to keep in mind is that uh, we don't really need the Fed to make, you know, three cuts. I think the one risk to markets would be that the inflation is accelerating to the point where the Fed has to hike and therefore really weaken the economy. I, I think that's still very much a tail scenario, but that's the one, of course, that would unsettle markets the most. Professor Ranjan, how critical is China's recovery to global economic performance? Well, uh, it certainly is very important, right? China has been the engine of global growth for a long time, uh, pre-pandemic. But I think it's also important for, uh, you know, the reflationary forces we're seeing. I mean, if you look at commodity prices, they were largely dead in the water for the last year because uh, China wasn't uh, performing up, uh, you know, up to expectations. As Chinese growth news is getting better, you're seeing some commodities perk up. Certainly, you're seeing copper pick up some uh, in, in recent weeks. So, so my sense is that the deflationary effects uh, of China, which have been substantial, especially on the good side, uh, may uh, abate a little bit if Chinese growth picks up. And of course, it will also add to global demand, which is important. Uh, it was back in 2005, I believe, Professor Rajan, where you had called in Jackson Hole, where you had said that the U.S. financial system is facing great stress. And then a couple of years later, we saw this great crash in 2008. When you analyze the U.S. economy, where we're at, where Treasury yields are trading, do you have similar concerns? 
No, I, look, I, I think we haven't seen the last of the mini crisis we saw in the banks uh, in, in March of 2023 in the sense that uh, a lot of uh, small and mid-sized banks are still sitting on uh, long-dated long assets. And, and this is where, you know, higher for long, uh, higher long bond yields uh, could result in some of them having to mark assets to market, uh, you know, even some below the value of their equity. So some of them may be underwater. We aren't still out of those woods. Uh, we have uh, sort of alleviated the immediate panic, but some of that is, is a source of concern. Of course, sharp yeah. movements in markets uh, uh, almost always create problems somewhere. It's, uh, it's hard to know where, uh, uh, with what big bets are uh, the shadow financial system taking now, which hedge funds are uh, extremely ill positioned for a sharp movement in interest rates, uh, but that will uh, that will that could also happen. But uh, so far, uh, you know, we haven't seen mm -hmm. the kind of turmoil play out, uh, for example, that we saw before the global financial crisis. And uh, I think it's uh, as uh, as our other participants said at this point, uh, uh, tail risk rather than the central scenario. Tom, Tom, back to you with a question on small caps, which you say will probably outperform the S&P 500 by 50 percent this year. A lot of people have been predicting the, that the day of small caps is going to arrive. Why are you so confident right now uh, when it has taken so long for that uh, sort of prophecy to come true? Uh, well, that's quite a prophecy, right? Um, I think it's we're we're e exiting more than a decade of underperformance of small caps versus the large caps, and now we're at a point where the risk reward is so attractive. Investors really should be thinking about them. Uh, we hadn't really recommended small caps for several years until this year. First, on a price to book basis, which is really the most important measure, they're trading at 44 percent of the S and P, right where they were in 1999. But projected growth this year is much higher with median earnings growth in the Russell 2000 of around 19% for EPS versus 11% for the S&P. And on forward PE, you're paying 10 times the median PE for the Russell 2000 against S&P around 16 times. So kind of multi-decade low in valuations, better growth. But of course, sort of the timing accelerant is when the Fed uh, can really conclusively begin to cut rates. I think that's one reason why mm -hmm. small caps have really been hurt in the right. last couple of weeks is that delay. Tom, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Professor Rajan, thank you as well. Meantime, coming up, a power player and change maker in the sports world. We'll speak to the commissioner of the WNBA next. What a week she has had. Plus, Netflix reporting after the bell. It's seen some strong growth in recent quarters. So what is on investors' watch list power lunch will be right back.